morning we are continuing in John's Gospel. I would like uh, to begin by uh, reading verses 19 through 24. Uh, John chapter 7, verses 19 through 24. Remember that this is, uh, well, a bit of the background. Jesus uh, has gone up to the Feast of Booze. This is one of the three required feasts that every Jewish man had to go to. It almost appeared as though he didn't want to go because his brothers said, you know, why don't you go up to the feast and show yourself to your disciples. And uh, Jesus said, I'm not going to go up to this feast. It almost sounded like he, he wasn't going to go. But we knew he had to go because it was a required feast. And now we see uh, Jesus, as we saw last time, going into the temple and proclaiming God's truth publicly. Now there wasn't any fear in Jesus' part. He was intending to go to this um, you know, to this feast, and he was intending to teach as his father called him to, and of course, having done that, draw down the ire of the people against him. And again, because of that one charge that he had broken the Sabbath. So let's, let's read um, now this next section, beginning in verse 19. Jesus said, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed. And you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses will not be broken... Are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. By the way, I misread uh, what I was intending to read here. Uh, there is one section in here um, in verse 22. I was going to make mention of this. Actually, this is probably the best place to do it. Uh, I don't know if you understand this. Perhaps I've mentioned it before. If you've had a chance to study Greek, you would know this to be the case. But in the Greek, all the characters are either capitalized or they're all lowercase, the whole text. Okay? And there are no spaces. There's no punctuation. There are no periods. There's, there's no spaces of any kind between the letters. The words aren't even divided. It's just one continuous run-on text. And for that reason, you need to know where to divide the words, you need to know where to divide the sentences, and sometimes there's a little bit of disagreement. Well, there is one right here when in verse 21, verses 21 and 22. Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel for this reason. Now, for this reason fits better with the verse that actually comes before than it does with what comes after. You marvel for this reason, because I did this one deed. And if you put it with the following sentence, it doesn't really seem to make sense. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision. That doesn't make sense. So anyway, we're going to put for this reason with that previous sentence, and I'll, I'll make reference to that a little bit later. Now, I'd like to begin this uh, sermon with, with an illustration that I've used before, but I thought would fit very well uh, in this, because I think it's a great illustration of what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, when the service at a local church uh, was over and the people were coming out, uh, to go home. Uh, a woman saw one of her friends and she called out to her, Hi, how you doing? But her friend turned up her nose and went back into the building without saying hello, without acknowledging her. Now the woman who greeted her friend was so offended that she refused to talk to her friend for several years. And when she finally worked up the courage to confront her, her friend responded, I was wondering why you've been avoiding me for so long. When I came out of the building on that day, my nose started to bleed, so I had to elevate it and run back into the building, into the restroom to take care of the problem. In other words, the woman who had called out to her friend really misjudged her friend's, her, her friend's actions and her friend's motives. She didn't judge righteously. Now, how many times have we done exactly the same thing? by rushing to conclusions based upon what we thought was irrefutable evidence, only to find out later that we were entirely wrong. Well, that's exactly what the Jews were guilty of 
when they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. Far from being guilty of a sin that deserved death, Jesus was actually obeying the law. Now, we, we have to ask ourselves the questions, how could they be so wrong? Well, it's because they were doing what Jesus tells us not to do in our passage this morning. He says in verse 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, last week, we saw Jesus not only go up to the feast publicly, well, actually, he went up secretly, but he went to the temple where he publicly and courageously began to teach. Now, we know that Jesus did this not only because this is what the Father sent him to do, but because he knew his people needed to hear the truth. They needed to know the truth. This is the only way they could be saved. And Jesus was willing to risk what he needed to risk in order to bring the gospel to them. Now, we also saw the Jews' response to his teaching. Remember, they were amazed both at his learning, at his understanding, and how powerfully he could communicate. How could Jesus do this? I mean, after all, he hadn't been to their schools. He hadn't sat under their teachers, under their experts. And yet he spoke with a greater knowledge, with a greater wisdom, a greater clarity, and certainly greater power than any of their experts, any of their scribes. Now, they were further amazed at the fact that he would be willing to do this in public in front of a group of people that he knew wanted to kill him, especially the leaders of the Jews. Now, this morning, what I want us to consider is why it is they wanted to kill Jesus, why they judged unrighteously, why they falsely accused him when all he had done was simply what what his father called him to do, and that was to show compassion, to show mercy on a man on the Sabbath. And secondly, I want us to consider, because we also, if we are honest with ourselves, have the heart of a Pharisee, not exactly like them, because if we've trusted Jesus, we do have a love for what is right in our hearts, but we still have to deal with the old man, with the sin that's still inside of us. How can we avoid doing what these Jews did to Jesus. So first of all, let's ask the question, why did they falsely accuse Jesus? You know, that's the question that Jesus is actually asking in our text. In verse 19, he says this, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now, Moses, of course, we know, is the one who gave them the law. Moses is the one that they all respected. It was always Moses, you know, that is the one who would trump all others because he was the greatest prophet. Now, Moses told them, among other things, you shall not murder. That's one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? It's the Sixth Commandment. But yet, they were not willing to keep the law. As a matter of fact... Even more generally, he says no one was willing to keep any of the law. That's a rather broad and sweeping statement, isn't it? But yet it is true. Does that mean that no Jew anywhere did anything that was even remotely connected to the law of God? Well, here's where we need to understand what the Lord actually requires in the law of God. You can do it outwardly. You can go through the motions, but that's not all what God desires. That's not everything. I'm sure that many of the Jews went through the motions. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees on many occasions would, would often talk about and boast in their law keeping. They may have looked like they were keeping the law. They may have looked like they were doing some of the things that the law required at least, but none of them were actually keeping it the way that they should keep it. And you know the way that we are called to keep the law is out of love for the Lord, love for his redemption. The Jews should have been keeping the law out of love for the Lord who redeemed them out of Egypt because he had brought them out of captivity from the Babylonians. Remember, they were in captivity for 70 years, but he brought them back into their land and he allowed them to rebuild their city and their temple. They should have been keeping the law out of the love that they had 
for this God who had been so merciful to them. And they should also have done it because they wanted more than anything else to honor him. But that was far from their hearts and far from their minds because they did not know the Lord. Now, how did Jesus know that that was the case? I mean, how did he know that was the reason why they were doing or just going through the motions and that they really weren't keeping the law? Well, it's because Jesus had the anointing of the Spirit of God and he knew it was in the hearts of all men. But the other reason was really a little bit more obvious. They were trying to kill him. Didn't Moses tell you, you shall not kill, you shall not murder, and yet you are trying to kill me? Why aren't you keeping the law of Moses? Well, that's what Jesus charged them with. And when he charged them, did they confess? No, they didn't. We read in verse 20, the crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? In other words, Jesus, you're out of your mind. There's nobody around here who wants to harm you or wants to kill you. Now, I do think that we need to understand, we, need, we, we shouldn't assume that every single one of them had it out for Jesus because people were still torn about who Jesus was and you know, what, what he was really doing there and whether they should accept him or not. There were those who didn't really know what to think about him. There were those who certainly did know what to think about him. Uh, but they were still, you know, some of them were undecided. Now, Jesus, I think, was speaking of the Jews collectively. The Jewish leaders hated him. The Jewish leaders had already determined what they were going to do to him, and I think Jesus was speaking collectively. They had already determined to put him to death. Now, why is it that they hated Jesus so much? Well, you know what? The Jews, the leaders, pointed to just one thing. Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. Jesus says in verse 21, because he knew exactly what they were charging him with, Jesus answered them, I did one deed and you all marvel. That one miracle, which you know was simply meant to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, that's why he did these miracles, that he was the Holy One sent from God to show everyone. He said, I did this one deed and you all marveled. Initially, they were all astonished. They were all amazed. But once the amazement wore off, some believed. Some were wondering what they should believe. And some wanted to kill him because he broke the Sabbath. Now, doesn't that seem rather harsh of the Jews? That they would want to kill Jesus just because he broke the Sabbath, even if that were true. Well, on the one hand, yes, it does seem rather harsh, doesn't it? It sounds like it's overkill, but I think it's because we don't understand what God's Word actually says. You know, we're so used to God's grace, aren't we? We're so used to His mercy that we begin to expect it. We expect to see mercy. We expect to see God be merciful all the time when we see certain things happen, like Ananias and Sapphira. Did you... Give all the money from the sale of your property? Yes, that's what we did. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. God's going to strike you down. Boom, they're dead. How could God do such a thing? It was the Holy Spirit that struck them dead. How could, how could God do that? Well, the question we should be asking is, why hasn't he done that to everyone? Because that's what everyone deserves for their sins. But you see, God doesn't always exact justice, does he? God is merciful. God is gracious, and He shows mercy all the time. As a matter of fact, more often than not, He shows mercy because He is a God who delights in showing mercy. Micah, the prophet, writes in chapter 7, verse 18, Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of His possession? He does not retain his anger forever, notice, because he delights in unchanging love. Now, this is directed to God's people. This is the kind of mercy and grace that God shows to his people, but he shows us even to those who aren't his people. And we see it so frequently 
that we begin to think that that's all that God does. That's what he's all about. He is simply a God of mercy. And we forget that he is also a God of justice and that one day he's going to call into account every single sin that everybody has ever committed except for those who have trusted Jesus because all their sins have been forgiven in Jesus. That's why he died on the cross. So we ask the question, is this charge of, you know, Jesus deserves to be put to death because he broke the Sabbath, is that harsh? Well, we say, well, yes, it seems harsh because we're so used to God's mercy. But on the other hand, it really isn't harsh because that's what God says the breaking of the Sabbath actually deserves. Again, we're not used to hearing that, <clears throat> but that is exactly what God's word says. Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 to 35. Have you ever read this account and wondered, my goodness, what, what's going on here? Why, why would they penalize a man as they did in this case? Well, let, let's read it and see. Now, while the sons of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation, and they put him in custody because it, it had not been declared what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. He was, what was he doing? Picking up, gathering wood on the Sabbath. What was so bad about that? God said, you shall no, do no work on the Sabbath. You shall have a day of complete rest, except for those exceptions that we talked about earlier, works of mercy, works of necessity. Is God being harsh? No, he isn't being harsh. This is exactly what sin deserves. God said, don't pick up stick, or you know, don't pick up wood, don't gather wood on the Sabbath. And this man went out and he gathered wood on the Sabbath. He broke God's commandment. In the face of this infinitely holy God, he decided he would rather do what he wanted to do rather than what God wanted him to do. That we call cosmic rebellion. And people are guilty of it all the time, we, every, even Christians. Now again, if God always exacted justice, nobody would be left standing. We would look like Ezekiel's vision when when he had the man with the iron stylus that is God, you know, put a mark on every man who has not abandoned God and then the men who follow behind utterly slay everybody in whom is not the mark. And Ezekiel watched as the men went through the city and they were all killed, they were all slain. And he says, God, alas, Lord God, are you going to kill all of Israel? Are they all gonna die? And God says, no, I've reserved for myself a remnant. You know, and that's what God does. But Sometimes he exacts justice. One day he will exact a perfect justice on the day of judgment. But until that time, he is merciful. We understand he is merciful. We thank God that he is a God who delights in mercy. But the point I want to bring out here is that even though he is and even though he does show mercy, we need to understand that our sins still deserve death and that our proper response to this is not to sin but to turn from our sins. Don't trade on the grace of God. Remember what Paul says in Romans, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Now we are to turn away from every sin and we are to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and we are to follow him as he leads us. Don't mistake the mercy of God for his approval. God hates sin. And he does not want us to continue in it. He wants us to do what is right because what is right is loving and it is honoring to him and to your neighbor. Now, again, the Jews thought Jesus had broken the Sabbath and that's why they wanted to kill him. But now we need to ask the question, did Jesus really break the Sabbath? Is that what he really did? Well, obviously not because Jesus is the spotless lamb of God. If he had really broken the law, he would have been under God's wrath. He would have deserved to suffer on the cross, and when he suffered, it would have been only for his own sins. He would never have been able to pay that price for you and for me if he had sinned. No, Jesus always did exactly what the Father wanted him to do. He wasn't sinning here. And the reason he did what the Father wanted him to do was because he loved him. 
and because he wanted to honor him. And by the way, that is the example that our Lord Jesus Christ sets for us. That's what he wants us to do, to follow him. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to love his father and to honor him in the way that he did. And the way he did that was by doing exactly what the father wanted him to do out of love for him. Now, because of this, Jesus now sets out to show these Jews that they were wrong. He hadn't broken the Sabbath. They had falsely accused him. He begins his argument in verse 22. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision. Not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. Now, let me just again mention, for this reason, doesn't really fit with that verse. So we're going to take that out and we're going to read it this way. Moses has given you circumcision. Not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. Circumcision was a part of the Mosaic Covenant. It didn't originate with Moses, didn't begin with him. It began with the fathers, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. More specifically, it began with Abraham. This is the covenant God made with Abraham, Genesis 17, verses 10 through 13. The Lord said to Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Notice, and every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now, you, you see here, God made a covenant with Abraham. And in that covenant, God wanted him to circumcise his offspring and the, ser the offspring of his servants and his servants. Every male shall be circumcised. When somebody is born in your household, that child, if it's a male child, shall be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, do you suppose that any of these children reached their eighth day on the Sabbath? Well, they certainly did, unless God providentially kept any women from bearing children on a day that would make it land there, which we know he didn't. Now, when this happens, you were faced with a choice, if you were a faithful Jew, to circumcise the child on a day other than the eighth day, which would be to break the law of circumcision, or to go ahead and do it on the Sabbath. Well, what did God want them to do? He wanted them to circumcise on the Sabbath. God allows us to do what we have to do in order to honor Him on the Sabbath, something that can't be put off until another day. Again, we've been looking at, at that in the devotions, and we call that necessary works. What about what Jesus did? What about healing a man on the Sabbath? Is that what God would have him to do and us to do? Jesus continues in verse 23. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Now again, the Jews circumcised on the Sabbath so that they would not break the law of circumcision. Are there any laws that Jesus would have broken if he had not healed that man on the Sabbath? In other words, did Jesus do this because he was keeping the law of Moses? Well, what about this one? Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then in verse 34 of the same chapter, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. If you came across somebody who was in need on the Sabbath, and you were able to meet that need, he was suffering. Maybe needed some help with something because, you know, he's 
Maybe his car had a flat tire, ran off the road or something like that. The, the person needs help or he's stuck, stuck there or he's injured and he needs some kind of, uh, some kind of ministry, some kind of, of help. Should you put it off? Say, this is, this is the Lord's day. I'm not supposed to do any work today. I'm afraid you'll just have to wait till tomorrow. So stay here out on the freeway. Uh, you know, I won't call the ambulance or I won't meet that need. So you're hungry, so what? Well, be hungry for another day uh, and I'll feed you tomorrow. Are we supposed to put off deeds of mercy, uh, you know, works of mercy, works of love that our neighbor needs to the next day because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath? Well, I think we'd all understand that would be cruel. And you wouldn't want somebody to do that to you if you happen to be the person who was in need. And so you are not to do that to others. You are to love them as you love yourself. Now listen to how Jesus responds to those who criticized him on another occasion when he healed a woman who was bent over on the Sabbath and didn't put it off until another day. And how the Jews, how, how they saw this reflecting on themselves in Luke 13, verses 11 through 17. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated. And the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. You see, mercy is something God commands us to show at all times, especially on the Sabbath. Jesus didn't sin. Jesus was really only doing his duty. So what is the point of all this? Jesus tells us in verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Don't make hasty judgments. Don't make false accusations. Make righteous ones. Make right ones. The Jews had falsely accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath but far from breaking the Sabbath, he had actually honored the Sabbath. He had honored his father. He had loved his neighbor. And so now we have to ask the question, why did they do this in the first place? Why did they accuse him? Was it because they had such a high regard for the law of Moses and for the Sabbath? Well, no. Jesus said, none of you actually keep the law. You have no regard for the law of God. You see, if, if it had been the Sabbath, it would have been something else because they really hated Jesus, really. Was it that they didn't understand that this is what the Lord wanted them to do on his day of rest? You know, we might have assumed that was the case, but then Jesus basically left them with egg on their face. They were humiliated because of what he said, because of what they were willing to do. They were willing to loose their animals. They were willing to show mercy to their animals. If a donkey fell into the ditch, wouldn't you pull your donkey out? If your, your, your animals are thirsty, won't you untie them and take them away to water. They were willing to do that for their animals, but they weren't willing to do that for people. I think Jesus having exposed their hypocrisy, we understand it was because they hated Jesus. It wasn't because of any other reason. They hated him so much that they were willing to reinterpret God's law so that they could accuse him even of a crime that deserved death when Jesus was actually absolutely innocent, righteous, and holy. Here was one they should have loved more than any other. They should have loved with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, but they despised him, and they condemned him falsely. 
Now, what does that have to do with us? Well, as I've already told you, how many times, you know, from, again, from the example I, that we gave at the beginning, how many times have we been guilty of doing exactly the same thing? And perhaps for the same reasons, and how can we avoid it? Now, the Bible says that we, too, came into this world like the Jews. We came into this world hating God. And I think, again, the classic passage that tells us that is Romans chapter 8, verse 7. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Basically goes on to say that it cannot, well, it will not subject itself to the law of God. And it cannot do so. The reason is because we hate God. That's the way we come into the world. We have the same heart the Jews had. In other words, like them, we may have had the law, but none of us kept it. Not the way God calls us to. We might have done some of the things outwardly that, that looked good, but we did not do it for the right reasons. We did not do it because we loved God. We did not do it because we wanted to honor Him. Our hearts were like those of the Jews before God in His mercy saved us through His Son. Now the question we need to ask is, once the Lord saves us, once He gives us His Spirit, once we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, do we... Uh, does that hatred go away? Because we have a new heart now, are we perfect? Do we no longer need to be concerned that we might do the same things that, that the unconverted people do? Well, I just need to point to you a couple of examples in Scripture. Didn't Peter deny that he even knew Jesus Christ? Didn't King David commit adultery with Bathsheba? Have Commit murder. Had Uriah, her husband, put to death? I mean, can true believers commit Sins like these? Oh, yes, they can. Even though we are new creatures in Christ, we know that the old man is still present, and so we need to be on our guard, don't we? Have you ever made a rash or a hasty judgment against your brother or sister about what they did or about why they did it? Have you ever found yourself in a situation like the one that I mentioned earlier regarding the woman where you believe somebody did something wrong to you, but you were mistaken because you misjudged their actions, you misjudged their motives? Have you ever strung together a list of circumstantial evidences against your neighbor and then condemned them for something they didn't really do? I think we've all done that at one time or another. Now, we don't always reach wrong conclusions, but Jesus is telling us here that we need to be careful that we don't do that. He's telling us that love for our neighbor dictates that we think the best concerning others rather than the worst, that we put the very best construction that we can on what we see them doing and what we've heard that they've said, not the worst construction. Now again, how is it that we arrive at wrong conclusions? Well, obviously because of the sin of our hearts, but we can do the same things these Jews did when they accuse Jesus. First thing is, we're too hasty to judge. We don't take the time to think through. You know, we, we basically jump to conclusions, whether we really have a legitimate reason to get angry with someone, with a righteous anger, of course, or to censure someone for what it is they've done. I think the second reason is because of the sin that's inside of us, we don't love others the way we should love them. And let me just remind you what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 6. This is the kind of love the Spirit of God gives us, which gives us the ability to do what the Lord is telling us to do. But because of sin, we don't always behave this way. But this is how we ought to. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag. And is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, even if we really are wronged, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now let me ask you, do you tend to put the best construction on the words and actions of those people whom you love? That's what love does. It, it puts the best construction on them. 
But don't you also know from your own experience that you tend to do just the opposite with those people you hate? You, you can't see anything good in them. You can't hear anything they say but criticize it because of the disposition of your heart. So we don't love them the way we should. The third reason is pride. I mean, these Pharisees thought they had all their ducks in a row. They thought they were perfectly righteous. They thought they were better than they really are. And don't we often find ourselves thinking that we're better than we are? I would never do that. You know, I distance myself from that like the Pharisee who goes into the, the temple with the tax gatherer and they both went in there to confess their sins. And the Pharisee is, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this man, you know, here. And I'm not like other men. I'm better. And then the, the, the tax gatherers, you know, just beat on his chest and he said, God, he didn't even look up to heaven, but he says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. But haven't we often found in our own hearts that heart of pride? We're so much better than they are. Now, if we really understood our own hearts, if we really knew what we were capable of doing apart from God's grace and that we wouldn't be any different than the person we're seeking to criticize or accuse, we wouldn't be so quick to condemn them if we understood our own hearts. And the fourth reason is, I think, perhaps even a genuine misunderstanding of what the Scripture actually says. You know as well as I do that, that we can know what the Scripture says and we can twist it so that what we want to do actually fits in there and I can do it without thinking I'm guilty of sin. That's the way that sin works in our hearts. We can do the same thing when we twist it to accuse other people. So we need to understand that even though God breaks the power of sin when he saves us, he doesn't completely remove it. So we do need to be careful. And so the question I would ask in closing is this, what should we do? How can we avoid this? Well, the first thing is, of course, don't make hasty judgments against your neighbor. Make sure you see it the way it really is. Make sure you, you know, if it is a, something he's done against you, make sure you, you do some research, do some investigation, find out what actually happened, and maybe even talk to them. But don't make a hasty conclusion. Don't jump to conclusions. Make sure you understand what they've done. Make sure you understand what they've done in the light of Scripture. Secondly, try to view what your neighbor has done to you through the eyes of love. You know, if, if what they've done is provoked you to get angry, you need to bring that anger under control and remember that the Lord calls you to love your neighbor as yourself. Even not taking into account a wrong suffered, Peter says that love covers a multitude of sins. And we need to cover one another's sins with love. So seek to view everything that your neighbor does, particularly your brothers and sisters in Christ, through the eyes of love. Grow in love. Seek to be filled with the Spirit of God so that you will tend to think the best about others rather than the worst. Third, humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself in your own eyes. You know, when you're humble and you see just how great your sins are, you tend not to elevate the sins of other people above your own. Instead, you say like Paul, you know, I'm the chief of sinners. You, want, you need to realize that the only reason why you're any different anyway than they are and why you haven't done what they have done is simply because of God's grace. So let your heart be moved to pity them. I mean, considering yourself and not condemn them. William Perkins... The father of Puritanism once wrote this, and it's, it's very good counsel to help us. He says this, Do not despise your neighbor, but consider yourself as bad a sinner, and that you might do the same things. If you cannot excuse what he did, excuse his intent, which may be good. Or if, he, if what he did is evil, consider it was done out of ignorance. If you cannot excuse him, Consider that he fell into some great temptation and that you would be worse if the same temptation happened to you. And give God thanks that the same as yet has not happened. Do not despise a man for being a sinner. For though he is evil today, he may turn tomorrow. Don't condemn him, but love him. Seek to bring him to repentance. Uh, hope that he does. Pray that he does. Do good to him. Do good to him. 
You see, the Lord does not give us any option for revenge. He doesn't give us any option for bitterness and anger and hatred. He tells us we must love even our enemies. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to love our enemies. It's impossible for us, but all things are possible with God, and he gives us his spirit so that we might do this. And then finally, study the scriptures so that you continue to grow in your ability to see things the way you really should see them and not as you choose to see them. Sometimes we get angry at people because they broke some rule that we thought the Bible taught, or maybe we knew the Bible didn't taught it, but, teach it, but we, we thought it was wrong anyway. We really need to see things the way they are, and we can only see them that way by reading the scriptures and knowing what it is that God actually wants us to do. Now, there is one other thing that I didn't address here, and I'd like to do it just finally, and it's this. That if you don't know Jesus, you do need to understand the reason why you make rash and hasty judgments and you condemn people and you're unmerciful when you find yourself in this condition is because you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because you haven't loved and trusted him. It's really the evidence that you don't know him, that you're dead in sin and don't really have the power to do what the Lord calls you to do. So if you find your, within yourself an unmerciful heart that is quick to accuse and condemn other people and censure other people, it's because you need to be born again. You see, you, you have a heart that is bound over in sin and you need God's grace. Now, you do need to understand that if that particular problem is not fixed, if that hasty judgment, that unforgiving heart is not repaired by the grace of God, that on the day of judgment, you will be condemned. It may sound harsh, but again, that's the truth. That's what God says, and it's right. It's good because God is just. James chapter 2, verse 13, listen to what James says, and he says this as a warning to us in advance so that we'll deal with the problem before the day comes. How would you like to show up on the day of judgment and not know? God's given you a conscience to tell you that you've sinned against him. When you do things that are wrong, it convicts you. So you do know. But he also tells you in his word, James 2.13, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you don't show mercy to others, judgment will be merciless to you too. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 14 through 15, again, words that are very sobering. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Remember the story of the servant who was forgiven this huge debt by his master, but then he was unwilling to forgive another servant, a little minor debt. The master held that first servant accountable for his whole debt, threw him into prison. Jesus says, my heavenly father is going to do that to you unless you forgive others from your heart. Unless you're willing to show mercy to others, the Lord will not show mercy to you. Are we saved by works? Are we saved by showing mercy to others? No. Our Lord is simply telling us that this is one way that you can know that you have been born again and forgiven by God's grace is that you are able to show mercy because you have been shown mercy. So how can you do this? There's only one way you can do it, and that is through Christ. Only by receiving God's mercy as he offers that mercy to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you turn from your sins and you trust Jesus to save you, he will save you, and he will also give you the ability to show mercy to others and to forgive others. So if that's what you find in your heart this morning, an unmerciful heart, come to Jesus and receive.